Our scripture lesson this morning comes from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 11, and verse 16. Hear the word of God. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be a prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, and your throne shall be established forever. The scripture we heard during our Advent candle lighting was uh, Zechariah's song or prophecy. He was a priest in the sanctuary, in the house that was built for God. And we just heard about David's desire to fix a place and not content that God should be in a tent that moves around, a tabernacle, to fix God. God, a singular place. And yet, God had something to say about that. <laughs> this, this idea of fixing a place, of containing God, of controlling and situating God in one particular place, continues throughout history. Because we are often situated and we find ourselves and fix our places in life too. We discover who we are, what our story is, and we discover our own voice, whatever that voice may be. And we situate and fix our place in that, with that voice. I was at uh, Winston McCullough graciously taught and gave a little presentation about music and how it helps tell our story or what what music's part is in our story, in the Christmas story. It was great. He mentioned Brahms, and Brahms uh, was asked, what is music? Is it something that you just labor and intense over and you create and comes from someplace within you? But Brahms says he sees himself more as a interpreter, a translator, a channel of something that is beyond himself, had a more mystical, spiritual idea of what music 
is. That his voice, it really wasn't about his voice, but his ability to hear the ever-changing voice, music, beyond his own mind and heart and soul. When you hear the term finding your voice, you may react differently. You may think, well, I know my voice. I know who I am. I know my story. I know what I believe. Some of you might think, well, that was a long journey and a hard journey and a changing one where my voice developed and grew. For some, it may be I'm still on that journey trying to discover just what my particular voice and place is in this world, in this existence. Zechariah had his voice, and he gives this prophecy only after having lost his voice for what we seem seems to be for the entire pregnancy of when he was told that his wife would be with child. And he has to wait for that entire time, unable to speak. Until it came time for the child's circumcision, eight days after birth, when the child was traditionally named. And traditionally, it would have been named Zechariah, or at least another family name. That was the way things were done. But Zechariah is finally able to speak, and what he says is that his name is to be John. He will be called John just as he was instructed to to name his child by the angel. In Hebrew, John means God is gracious. Yahweh is gracious. Zechariah, interesting guy. He was a priest. Priests lived life probably the way that he was told to live. That priests were supposed to live. There were rules and ways of living and ways of believing and being. He knew his voice. He knew his story. He was to be a priest. And when the lots were cast, he was supposed to go into the sanctuary and burn incense. The sanctuary being the Holy of Holies, the place where God is. The situated place for God. He had his voice. Being a priest was very structured. And yet that is broken apart when in that sanctuary an angel appears. And the angel says to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink, Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I don't think this is the story or the voice that Zechariah had envisioned for himself not what he expected first he probably was resigned to the fact that they couldn't have children had gotten old and decided that that just wasn't their story they had tried but could not but this angel is telling them their life is in for a big plot twist and something new would happen and not only would they have the child But this child would not grow up to be a priest like Zechariah. Would not live the life expected of a priestly line following in dad's footsteps. In fact, you could say John grew up challenging the very system that his dad perpetuated and took part in. Anybody have kids like that? (laughs) It's like my child Alex deciding, Dad, I'm going to be a Pentecostal preacher. Be okay. (laughs) Could live with that. His dad 
was used to a God that was controlled, where there were systems or there were ways of worshiping God, ways of approaching God, ways of believing about God. And John would go out into the wilderness and, and invite people to be baptized, to prepare for something much greater, much bigger, much different than anything they had ever known, with a new story. And it was indeed a new voice. Zechariah, he asked questions of, the, of Gabriel, the, the angel, and he's doubtful. And for that, he is stricken silent. He loses his voice, and he is forced then to silently contemplate all that he had heard and been told by the angel. And in that silence, he was changed. He allowed God's voice to change his voice. He allowed God's story to enter in and change his own story. We live in a noisy world. <laughs> a lot of people have opinions. A lot of people know their voice and what they believe and what they think is right. You can turn on cable news and hear opinions around the clock if you like to. I don't recommend that. I don't think it's spiritually or intellectually healthy to do so. But many do. And then depending on what you hear, a particular voice or a particular opinion... You are hearing one side or one story. And you are hearing from people who are really confident, who know their voice, know what they stand for, and often argue down and criticize other voices. And many, many people are very confident in what they believe. And who they think they are, and especially who they think God is and who God isn't. And Zechariah was probably a bit like that. You don't end up a priest without a certain confidence in the system. Yet sometimes our voices are interrupted. Sometimes we need to hear a different voice and a new story. Rob Portman is a senator from Ohio, a Republican. And he was pretty party line and... and that party line, he included a pretty anti-gay marriage stance in his life. In 2011, he was classified as openly hostile to gay rights. And in hundreds of students at the University of Michigan, objecting to him speaking at the school's graduation ceremony, led a march. And it was quoted, Rob believes marriage is a sacred bond between one man and one woman. But then he heard another voice. He heard the voice of his own son, his child, that told him that, Dad, I'm gay. And Senator Portman sat with that for two years before he publicly said anything. He sought out the voices and opinions of others, of clergy, of fellow political colleagues. And that voice of his son, of son he loved and wanted to love, changed his own voice, his own story. And now he openly supports his son's right in all, all, all same-sex marriage. That also happened with Danny Cortez, who was a Southern Baptist preacher, whose son also came out to him, and after silence and journey and, and even many years of saying his son was not in line with God's story, finally could not hold on to that voice and story, listened and allowed the voice of his son to change his view and helped his congregation. Many of them changed. And the Southern Baptist Church expelled his congregation, but now is pastor of a New Heart Community Church, an independent but affirming church. Some people in this congregation have similar stories like that. Either a child or a friend that has helped them change by hearing another voice. Change their own. Sit with it and contemplate and listen. Those 
voices that don't get heard, that have been squelched out, that don't get listened to, when heard, have the power to change us. And right now, many of us are hearing the voices of disaffected people of color as people march and want to be heard about inequality and racial injustice that still continues to plague many places in our country. Now, it's easy for us to raise our voice, to go to our places and have our same opinions and not listen. But here's an opportunity for us to say how Can we sit? How can we listen? Where do we need to hear this voice and allow it to change our own stories, our own voices, our own systems of beliefs, our own systems of justice? It's important that we can listen and hear the voices of others. I lived for a short time in Richmond, California, and that doesn't have the greatest reputation for being a a safe place in the world. High crime rate. Richmond uh, has really undertaken a uh, a process of how to deal with this crime, and their police chief, Chris Magnus, and many of the, the police department brass, when all that was happening in Ferguson, instead of... Ignoring it, they stood shoulder to shoulder with community members during peaceful protests against police brutality. You see, they had been working a long time at a different way of policing, and one that listens to the community, one a community policing model, which I know our own police department tries to employ, where they are in touch with the community. Richmond Police Captain Mark Gagan said the police wanted to attend the demonstration not only to keep the peace, but also to show solidarity with the demonstrators. That yes, there was still much work to be done. Hearing the voice. This captain said, people have a real need to have their voices heard. And when that is stifled, it magnifies the problem. So we're here to listen, to hear, and stand with them. There are many voices in this world, and it can indeed be noisy. And we can close ourselves off and be confident that our voice, our story, is the right one for us. But are these other stories that are coming, are these other voices that we hear, have the power to help us hear a greater story? A greater voice. That's what this season is all about. Advent is a preparation to hear the breaking into our world of a new story, of a new voice. Now I know that we like to jump right into Christmas and we want to sing all the Christmas stories and, and as soon as Advent starts. But Advent traditionally was a time of repentance, of reflection, of preparing so that by the time Christmas Day came, you could break out with joyous songs. Yes, something magnificent, something wonderful, something beautiful has happened on this Christmas Day. Now I'm not a purist, so we sneak in our Christmas carols early. But I do not want us to lose the sense that this is a time when we wait, when we expect, when we repent, when we allow ourselves to change. And when Christmas comes, we can say, yes, indeed, this is a mighty, amazing thing that we celebrate every year. A new story that changes us, should change us should help us not to hold so tightly to what we think things should be and opens us up to the gracious love of God that breaks into this world. To hear the voices that don't get heard that Jesus and John came for, that Jesus and John stood up for, that Jesus and John both died for. To magnify the voices of all. 
saying we are all children of God and all of our voices matter. That is the voice of Christmas. That is the voice of God breaking into this world. To you, a son has been born, a prince of peace, a new voice, a new way. May we celebrate when we say Merry Christmas. Amen.